it's myself. Um, I'm Apostolis Dimas, I'm coordinator of um, currently um, on, uh, of uh, an EU uh, research and innovation project, uh, Prime Water. As, um, as Samuel I mentioned, Prime Water supports um, and has initiated this uh, COB together with IWA and Aqua Watch on uh, how earth observations can be used effectively in water resources management. And um, it would be, and this is a big question. I mean, uh, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of um, new science around these uh, technologies. Uh, and I think we try to demonstrate with these three presentations, the possibilities around using earth observations for water management and of course, Detection is, is a very key and central, um, um, let's say, application. But then uh, Earth observations can also be uh, used, uh, can support uh, planning uh, decisions, um, um, uh, but even, even more operational services like forecasting services uh, in hydrology, in water quality, and so, so, so on. So, it would be really nice to, I mean, and I think this is the first theme of, 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 our, of our discussion, um, uh, sharing experiences from, from other projects, from possible other uses from, from, from your site, uh, from applications from your site of, of this kind of, of, of services. In all those different ways um, we've, 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 we've mentioned and even, even beyond that. So please, please don't hesitate to, um, uh, contribute uh, either orally or by adding a sticker on, on the board. But it would be really nice to, to understand and hear on, on your experiences working with uh, Earth observations in different types and, and ways. I don't mind starting. Please, please do. Um, so I think we, we, I mean, we've been gathered here from around the world to hear about some uh, technologies. And I think we must all have very different experiences. And I think a lot of those experiences will have to do with how old we are. So <laughs> I'm gonna suggest to you how old I am by explaining my experience. And I think I was possibly one of the first um, generations to come across uh, uh, Earth observation data. And I did that through the technology called Google Earth. And I think Google Earth is probably the number one earth observation data tool that we use and i think a lot of use it like a lot of users use it like i do which is that we come across it from an earlier age and there's this kind of wow factor and it's kind of you know this is everything we need um and then and then <laughs> Perhaps this is not your experience, but I felt that there's like an almost like a like the brain kind of switches off, and I kind of think, okay, Google Earth has everything I need, and if I need more, then I'm going to hire a consultant or I'm going to hire an expert, and I'm going to. But I feel like now, <laughs> ten or fifteen years after I first discovered Google Earth, I think that's wrong. I think probably there's a lot of really accessible Earth observation data that's way more powerful than Google Earth that speaks specifically to what I need when I'm looking at water quality, like in Lake Victoria. And I don't have to reach for a consultant. I don't have to. So I'm interested in, I suppose, the educational aspects of, of getting the information into users' hands. So, you know, they're not immediate, they're not like Google Earth is not the beginning and end of their Earth observation experience, one. Two, they're not intimidated by, uh, a, by the little bit more technical knowledge that is required, but also by the cost. I think we're often intimidated by, you know, Google Earth is free. If you go beyond Google Earth, you're going to have to pay for it. That's, that's an, there's an intimidation aspect there because a lot of the people I work with, you know, they don't have big budgets. We're talking about very poor governments, national governments or local governments or, you know, private sector businesses who don't have large, you know, overhead budgets. So I'm interested in understanding, you know, how, how can we get real up-to-date information about what is accessible, what is out there, but also what is accessible? Like what is it? There's earth observation information, which is accessible um, to everyone. And there's other stuff for which you need a big budget. So, what is the difference and, and, and what are the ways we can share that information? That's what I'd love to hear about. Thank you. 
Well, that's a very uh, nice perspective in looking into that. Um, and I think it's very also realistic because it's 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 um, a matter of how at the end of the day somebody can use these very valuable um, uh, products and results. And um, it's also nice to hear that um, um, you feel that there is um, a high level of accessibility towards this direction because these in other cases seems to appear like uh, a significant barrier. In, in, in the uptake of, of, of bus services. So um, in, generally speaking, uh, water professionals, they're not so much familiar with this kind of, 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 of new services, new products, because of the reasons you've mentioned. I mean, um, uh, not easy, I mean, it's really, um, it might be difficult to, to have, uh, to gain access to um, uh, exactly what you, you need, or you might need a lot of time to, to, to spend searching around. Um, you, you, you nicely put it, uh, you know, uh, the, the cost issues um, as an intimidation factor. So uh, all those things uh, are, are really true. And uh, what you've mentioned, for example, the educational part of, of the whole uh, process is, is one of the key aspects that COP, this particular COP that IWA has initiated um, um, is very much um, looking for. So um, this is a thing, I think this is very central to the uh, objectives of these community of practice to, to bring together uh, in an easy and efficient way, let's say the technology, the technological factors with the professionals, with the water professionals um, and enable a little bit this, 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 inter this, this um, 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 interconnection. So I think I think this is this is really important uh, to know uh, as as a requirement. I, I received your 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 uh, contribution, your your reflection as a, as a requirement out of this uh, COP, uh, which I think is very very important. Now, in terms of, of uh, another very very quick comment before we somebody else uh, can jump into the discussion. So. Another thing that uh, appears to be true uh, nowadays is that there is a continuous investment in, in space technology uh, that to a certain degree is available to the public, is available to, to the users. Um, um, but there's also certain levels of, of, of downstream services from that point on that um, um, create a margin for, for, for businesses and other, other activities. So it is really important um, to understand where, uh, let's say, each one's needs lies. So obviously, if, 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 if um, particular needs can be fulfilled from, from those very nice, very strong, freely available, let's say, data, that's, that's really good course, there, there are premium, there, there are niche areas beyond that, that also uh, might, might be accessible, but then um, cost, cost implications might arise. So there is this distinction uh, between what's available and what it's not, but certainly what happens is that day by day, much more information, good information becomes available to users. Um, uh, from space technologies around the globe. So and that, I think that's an advantage. That's a very, very uh, good thing to know. So that's, um, that's um, a very, very, very uh, comment on my side. Any, any, anybody else, uh, any contributions from, from somebody else um, that is using, that has experience uh, working with Earth observations or downstream services that are using Earth observations like forecasts or, or even other types of services. Let me put it in another way. Um, is, is um, I suppose, uh, working with uh, in situ uh, data is, is uh, something that uh, most of us are more familiar with. I mean, um, working with, uh, with sensors on the ground, working with um, uh, measurements uh, taking uh, on the ground. Um, so how, how, how would you feel uh, making this, and I think that was a question. I mean, how would you feel, how would you see this transition? I mean, this entering of new data into, into, the, uh, into the play, um, new information into the play. Uh, how would you find this opportunity? 
would you be interested in investigating these opportunities or, or um, if you're reluctant uh, uh, towards the direction, try to rephrase a little bit uh, the question to maybe incentivize people to uh, enter in our discussion. You can also just share your, your experience based on your research, if you're doing like a PhD research or, you know, how you, how you use or plan to use EO practices and, and data and services in your work. So maybe Christian, you could tell us how you are interested in using it. Um, okay, and maybe I could share a little bit of, of our experience of a team in the university. We were working in a project called FIBAM, and it's um, focused on studying the river basin, the Andean river basin. So uh, I was um, working on quality control and homogenization of climatic data. Temperature, precipitation uh, are the most important variables, I guess, uh, but other workmates uh, were working on satellite precipitation data like um, satellites like CHIRPS or TRMM and we try to um, to work with this data because in the end and the Andean transition Andean Amazon zone there is no uh, field information and the data works well uh, in flat uh, in flat areas where there is no the transition uh, through mountains uh, the transition and 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 uh, and the amazonas uh, but in the transition there were a few problems because the precipitation da data were not uh, be well represented uh, so with this example i want to emphasize that still we need um, field data to calibrate or to complete uh, our expectations with our observations. Thanks. I mean, do you do you um, is there any particular uh, sectors, uh, socioeconomic sectors you, you're interested in around water water management uh, in particular? I mean, is it um, uh, ecological services, uh, potable water? Hydro power or aqua watch, aqua culture, any particular um, domain you would like to 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 know more about about earth observations and how it can be used. Yeah, I'm working mostly with the agriculture water consumption. Right. Yeah, and so we use a lot of uh, remote sensing satellite data, free to monitor um, uh, water consumption in irrigation field and. Uh, rain pad field um, so that they can adjust irrigation amount um, in agriculture to save more water yeah, and and what I find is um, like like the, in the question in the main section they say um, you need to complement remote sensing with in-situ data Okay, so I'll, uh, sin I'll start maybe uh, if you want to come on camera and uh, uh, introduce um, yourself since this is quite of a, um, a short little group. So um, I'll ask maybe um, uh, Sahadat if you want to introduce yourself first. Uh, this is Chadas Mushain. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, um, uh, I see Hills. So I'm Ilse Rosen from Vito Remote Sensing in Belgium, um, and I'm a partner in the Water Force uh, European uh, project where we are defining the uh, water component for the future Copernicus services. Thank you. And the uh, Socknet. Um, hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Socknet. Uh, I am a master graduate uh, from uh, Asian Institute of Technology uh, in Thailand, and I have experience using uh, uh, observation data, which is a uh, gravity recovery and climate experiment uh, to detect um, gravitational uh, dynamic. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you so much for being here. The um, ideas of today's um, session is to, um, um, in the first part, experience uh, share any experience of project and initiative that that you um, you may um, uh, have related to this um, topic of today, and you may be able to see my my screen. And uh, um, so um, I don't know if you can access this with the uh, link in the chat. Could you please confirm you are all in this board? Yeah. So um, if you want to contribute, um, so uh, um, as you see here, there are some sticky notes already there. And this is from uh, this morning um, session because we had meetings at the um, at two times. So uh, you can just click on the um, sticky note here on the left side and add your, your contribution or just um, share with me here um, any uh, input that you may have on, on, on this. So I'll, I'll, I'll open the floor for you. Anything um, else, anything from you or um, Sofnet, anything? Any uh, project or initiative that you uh, know that has related to this topic of today? Um, yes, as I, as I mentioned, um... The water force project and i see that linda already added this uh, sticky this note on on this um so as i said we are shaping the water component for the future copernicus services and we have a component on water quality and on water quantity uh, but also modeling is very important and, and today i saw in the presentation by uh, prime water that they are also integrating um, modeling in their um, platform. So these are the things that we also want to take on board uh, in Waterforce when we are uh, developing our roadmap, because we have to deliver a roadmap to the European uh, Commission on how um, what are the different elements that are needed for the future Copernicus services related to water. Mm -hmm. And of course, also user needs, and that and Linda is in charge for that. The collecting the user needs um, from policy and and um, UN and and international initiatives, and we also collaborate with Geo Aqua Watch um, closely. Mm -hmm. For example, we have an we also work on um, defining together with CIOs, um analysis ready data so data which uh, requires less effort from a user uh, to use in their in their work so that's also um, we're also doing that together with the geo aqua watch so the idea of having uh, analysis ready data is to make the um, heart observation more user friendly is that yes. correct yes yeah yes. Which is, I think, one of the challenges um, users are not used <laughs> to um, to all data, um, especially how uh, they arrived to to them. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, so, CEOs analysis ready data. That's the goal is to um, yeah to have satellite data that have been processed to a minimum set of requirements and organized into a form that allows immediate analysis with minimum additional user effort mm -hmm. and interoperability in time and with other data sets. So that requires a minimum of additional user effort. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the, um, Socknet, Lim, do you have any um, project or initiative that you, you uh, want to share with us? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, as I mentioned previously, I used to uh, use um, um, satellite based data set which is uh, called GRACE um, mm -hmm. to uh, access the uh, groundwater uh, storage chain in my country in Cambodia yeah mm -hmm. and it's like it's very uh, useful mm -hmm. for uh, the country like Cambodia we have less uh, very uh, little uh, mon uh, monitoring well in, in our country. So uh, the satellite base have uh, contribute uh, enormously to uh, our like policy maker or decision maker. Mm -hmm. And I just know like my friend, uh, she also uh, used 
um, as observation like that uh, to uh, detect the uh, water quality, like uh, turbidity of water. Yes, it, it just now from uh, like I don't have much experience, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for uh, for for that contribution. Um, during the this morning session, we discussed a bit about uh, um how can heart observation bring get together people from different countries because depending on the countries there is a different need so there was a bit of a discussion on uh, on 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 that with uh, your your uh, um, contribution just remind me of that so um, i think uh, um we I, I have some 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 notes so thank you both for 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 sharing uh, let me see if uh, um uh, let me see, let me see. Uh, no, I think um, Daniel um, joined the main session again. So we can maybe move to the um, second part of the uh, meeting. And I see other um, in the other groups, people are, are adding some sticky notes, which is nice. Um, so the second part of the, um, of the discussion is a bit about more um, the community of practice itself, so this community of practice. So what what do you um, think um, we could do to share more information? Do you think this kind of meeting, uh, this type of meeting are, are useful? Um, would you like more um, a webinar, a white paper that collects most information? So any um, suggestion on, on that point? I, 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 my, my personal opinion, uh, I think a white paper from mm -hmm. an, an organization like IWA, I think um, would help to raise more, to raise the awareness of earth observation in, in the water sector. So do you see, um, you see a, a, a general, white, a, a, the topic of the white paper being quite general or because um, we, um, we had thought about white papers, um, but um, it's always difficult to find the topic of it because you don't want to make it too broad, but you, wanna, you don't want to make it too um, narrow the topic. So um, what, what, what is your suggestion on that? I think uh, um, we, we will look into white paper because um, IWA member uh, do um, appreciate them. So I think it's a good uh, a way to share information. Um, but also I'm, I'm aware that people are very tired to read the documents in front of a computer. So we thought more about uh, um, quick information, mm -hmm. like a, a 10 minute, five minutes podcast or or a quick uh, a video would be more um, uh, impactful. Uh, but then you have to limit the kind of discussion that you do. Yeah, so uh, in uh, I think in uh, um, Water Force, you have a communication strategy as well. In Prime Water, we do, we do have, um, what kind of, uh, how, how do you communicate in information there? Um, in Waterforce, there is a, a website, uh, and in, in the sticky note, I've put the URL, uh, so everybody can com, com, can uh, contribute to to our work. Mm -hmm. um, so we have we will have yeah we have draft versions of, of reports, and and it's a community based effort, so everybody can can contribute to uh, to this. Uh, and we also organize, and that's what Linda is doing, um, webinars. Uh, there was one webinar on um, SDG uh, in February, and the next one will be on Copernicus for Africa. And we regularly organize um, expert working uh, workshops. So for, um, for water quality, for example, we have a, a, a list of, of experts worldwide and, and with also a lot of contribution from geo aqua watch uh, members uh, so for each of so for each of the the topics in water force we have uh, um, identified a list of experts uh, but this is is not a fixed list so this can this can uh, can can grow um, so we can add uh, experts to um, do this um and internally we have uh, we have newsletters and newsletter. I, the, the goal is also to have an external newsletter but i don't know exactly what the status is on, on that 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So newsletters are actually a good idea because it um, keeps people um, having all those collecting information all in one, all in one um, document. So I'll maybe add it here. Okay, so um, we have about five five minutes, but uh, um, uh, we we can uh, um, keep dis- discussing on this, or if you want to take a break and then we move back into the the main room, is really um, up to you. And I see someone adding training, which is what I was thinking um, before. I think um, people still see heart observation a bit far away from them, so having training could really um, make this useful. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll bring people back into the main room in about five minutes, uh, but uh, um, you can take this time to um, take a short break. Um, Sahada, do you have anything to add? Oh, okay, I have a question to Lynn that what type of challenges uh, do you face while using with your data? So uh, do you mean uh, the, the challenge that I made when I uh, used uh, satellite based data, right? Yeah, um, uh, the satellite based data is uh, like the, the spatial resolution is uh, very core, like, like great data. Is a uh, 55 by 55 kilometer. So, like, if because my study area is a bit small, so like when we interpret the uh, data, it's a bit like um, how to say, <laughs> like um, it's a bit uh, challenge like for us. Uh, so uh, the the core resolution is one problem, I think. Um, the the resolution, for example, for Sentinel two um, is ten or twenty meter. So, and this is also what is used by um, the company EOMAP. Uh, the examples they showed for um, all, they also combine it with planet data. But for for example, for turbidity or for total suspended matter, um, Sentinel two is used, and it's at 10 or 20 meter resolution. But thank you so much for your um, contribution. Well, then I start the official welcome and introduction, and then I see people are I see these but, uh, people are starting to work. So I think yes, let's let's bring it on. Um, we are in this breakout room today. Uh, I will ask you two questions, as Samuela said before. One is the experience with projects and initiatives. And that means with regard to understanding the different types and applications of EO data. But, and the second one will be more on how you could imagine to engage in this uh, COP. So um, before we start, maybe Adele, we can do a quick tour de table. Maybe you want to introduce yourself and then we can also um, let you know who we are. (laughs) Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, I am a PhD a candidate at IIT Delft in the Netherlands, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so in terms of my experience with good observation data, I have used previously some Landsat data to do um, um, flood detection analysis. So looking at um, trying to detect flooding, particularly in a, a data scarce regions where you may not have um, observations of flooding uh, but in my experience it was a bit tricky especially with Landsat data because um, I know it has like a much smaller temporal resolution so sometimes I would miss floods uh, miss the actual date of the floods and then I have actually tried to use Sentinel-1 to do that uh, but the Sentinel-1 also in my experience yes. misses some dates so even though it's higher resolution I have that problem uh, in addition to that I have used um, SRTM data for um, the DM delineation. But I should probably let you know that I work a lot in urban areas, so I need high resolution data. Mm-hmm. Um, but something I found, <laughs> listening to everything here, I realized now maybe more I use remote sensing data than I do use great observations. And actually, while we were sitting here, I started Googling, okay, re- remote sensing versus um, Earth observations because I use a lot more rainfall data. Mm-hmm. 
So for example, uh, GPM data, uh, GPM iMERGE, MS Web, which I think is more reanalysis data. Yeah. Uh, so those might be the products I think I use more now on a GTD basis. Mm -hmm. Well, previously in my last um, research, maybe about two or three years, I would have used um, more Sentinel in the SRTM type data sources. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Thank you. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just taking some notes here because we will put that. You could also then, if you want and have more ideas, put that yourself on that board. If yeah, you sure. if you uh, join the link, I mean, I, I hope I summarized it nicely. I mean, you were working with flood mapping with Landsat data as well as Sentinel-1, then as SRTM data for DM delineation um, and uh, rainfall data. And um, yeah. I think that would be remote sensing uh, rainfall data. Mm -hmm. um, and I said GPM, uh, primarily yes, exactly. GPM. This. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So you are, let's say, you, you already have hands on Earth observation data, I understand. And um, yeah, have yeah. good experiences. Yeah, yeah. I would say, like, yeah, my, my research is actually in flood forecasting. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's um, most of the data is just used um, for verification mm -hmm. of uh, some sort of analysis. So with the flood mapping, it's um, trying to verify what's any kind of forecasting that I've done, if we were able to actually detect the flooding areas correctly. And also um, for the mm -hmm. forecast of the rainfall, we would also use like the remote sensing type uh, data. So satellite or I say remote sensing data. Yeah. Data is used. Flood forecasting. So remote sensing data is used for um, validation. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that's fine. Very good application field. In terms of projects, what do you plan to do or do you already have? Are you involved in these Earth observation consortia or um, um, is that? No, I, I'm not involved at the moment. Uh, once upon a time, I, I used to be part of a group uh, that, gosh, I can't remember. It was using just like space products uh, for disaster risk reduction. Um, mm -hmm. So it was these similar type of products once again, but outside of that, um, I'm not just, um, like, uh, yeah, I'm not associated with any particular consortium or any particular mm -hmm. group. But that has nothing to do basically with, let's say, an, um, yeah, a barrier to do. use Earth observation is simply the type of work that you're doing at the moment. You, you're yeah, not. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Because we're also trying to understand, because my second question in, within this question, I was saying, well, if you have experience, please tell us about it. And if you don't have experience, well, what is the reason um, that you don't use Earth observation more often or you're, you're working with EU projects mm -hmm. and initiatives? But in this case- I could probably mm -hmm. add something to that. I would say um, that one of the challenges that I've had, is, I mentioned before briefly, because I work in urban areas and urban areas require such high resolution data, a lot of times you can't apply Earth observations especially with freely, um, mm -hmm. freely available data. I know there are some high resolution data that you actually pay for it. And I think this also applies, I haven't worked very much using Earth observation data in the Caribbean, which is where I'm from. But of course, being like a small island state, you do have similar uh, challenges with scale because we're just so darn small. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so of but course so damn beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, I think, um, as I said, I haven't specific, because I haven't worked too much with um, Earth observation data within the Caribbean, but my experience, uh, I can only imagine, like when I do think about the application is that it would be quite similar um, challenges with scale and that could possibly be a hindrance in applying as in, in, in that sort of um, case study or country as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, great. Okay. And um, 
I mean, we have two questions. I, I, we have 15 minutes normally for each question, but we are a very small group. So I wouldn't mind, we can jump also back and forth. I just show you our second uh, topic of, of this discussion and um, breakout room. And uh, then we can go back and forth uh, if you like. So the question here is, uh, do you have any suggestion on what you can contribute to this community of practice? So how can the COP further share information? Is it webinars, white papers, podcast series, also other ideas like a blog maybe? Um, and the other question is if you would like to be a volunteer. <laughs> so <laughs> this is just building up. It's the first meeting, the first COP mm -hmm. meeting. And um, I mean, depending on the response and, and uptake, there will be more meetings. So I've asked if there is a, a regular schedule already, which is not there yet, but it depends a bit on the involvement. Or if you say you already have something, uh, I don't know, you, you publish frequently information in some format. Yeah, if you could add that. So I don't know, you're happy to hear your thoughts on, on that. Um, first of all, am I the only, because is everyone else part of the group, which is why they're not Exactly, Adele, and I'm oh, sorry. I mean, I was, I was like, you're, you? you're the only one that is interviewed here because you are the only one who ended up in our group, obviously. Okay, so, okay, no Bibi Laura is our rapporteur. Karen is my colleague. You know, she has all the knowledge. She's the wise woman about the water quality. Oh, so okay, okay. The head of the water quality department at EOMAP. Okay. Yeah, hi. Okay. Hi, I can say some <laughs> few words. Hi, Adil. So first of all, uh, we have actually a colleague also from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, oh. So Edward, Edward Albeda. So he's now, okay. he, he moved now to Santa Barbara <laughs> since <laughs> two years, I think. But he was uh, before in a large company called Smith Warner in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, yeah, actually, we do a lot things in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, especially with um, satellite derived bisymmetry, also digital elevation models. And yeah, but as you said before, you need to have this very high resolution data from the commercial satellites, yeah, yeah. Like, like Worldview or even Planet. So it's, or Airbus, like the Playards, Playards mm -hmm, Neo, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, so if you want to go to this very high resolution, you need to have, of course, to, and, and, and there's a lot of applications here as well for all the survey or the engineering um, stuff. And urban waters are always challenging. <laughs> um, yeah. um, also from the resolution, but also from the, yeah, there's a lot of sewage and a lot of pollution. So we work mm -hmm. also a lot in India and here we really see they are heavily affected like the river sections and you have multiple stressors there <laughs> like um, human activities yeah. industry and stuff so it's interesting um uh, yeah and so flood detection we don't do that much so of course we touch it so we do also use sentinel one for water detection still it's not so reliable not reliable but some mm -hmm. sometimes robust <laughs> let's say yeah um <clears throat> with all the radar imagery, so we always have problems. Um, also for oil spill monitoring, we use Sentinel-1 sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's nice. <laughs> interesting. Um, I, I, Cause I did listen to your presentation with the water quality and it, it was interesting to learn about it. Cause at first when I saw it, I was like, oh geez, I, have, I know nothing about this, but it was nice to, um, to see the application of it. Uh, Cause at first I was like, I have, how is this done? How do you do this? But then when you explained it, I was like, oh, okay. That would make sense. <laughs> um, so no, that's nice. But to answer your question on this um, particular topic, I think a webinars are good. Um, of course, in, in the day and age webinars are, there's so many of them now. Uh, but um, for myself, I, I see, with especially with OOPS observation like there's so many tools that you have to use or tools that are available like because post-processing of the data is such a huge part of it um and maybe some people like you know about the product and you know the application but how to actually process the data you don't know so I think those could always be good ways um to get people involved because everyone want people want to learn how to how to actually do it themselves so that could be nice. Um, and of course, blogs would be good too, like seeing the application of it um, and then just reaching like a wider community. Um, 
like once upon a time like so I because I do like a lot of uh, work with like early warning systems uh, I do volunteer with like another group of young professionals that we have early warning systems young professionals group and we also try to engage people through um like these I get well maybe like technical events but also having more social events where people can just talk about their experiences uh, and then people can see what they have in common, like maybe two people are working on the exact same problem and they don't even know it. Uh, so it's just an, a nice way, or um, maybe just to like gather, understand who people are, what they're working on. And uh, like similar to this, just randomly putting people into rooms. I, I actually, that happened to me recently where I got into a group with someone and we realized that we had both been working on like serious game type stuff and we were able to help each other so that could be a really nice informal way uh, but other than that I think you have very good suggestions <laughs> of ways that it could actually be done um, and then even like just having projects so even um, we spoke about me personally I would love to see how these these sort of products could be used more abundantly in, in the Caribbean and in small island states Maybe that could be like a, an interesting project for people to take on if, if there's already like a, a specific problem that we know of, uh, people can work together and, and, and come up with like a solution and how you might supply it. But maybe that's maybe that was a little bit difficult to find things. But um, something like that could be a nice idea. If somebody proposes a problem and people work together as groups to come up with solutions. Great. I, I think these are very nice ideas beyond the classical, let's say, good ideas of uh, newsletters and white papers. So I hope I got it uh, right here. Um, and I see Bibi Laura is raising the hand. Do we have to look at the time? Or is it, did you just? No, no, this, this is not for time. I just wanted to, um, oh. well, ask the question. I don't know if I could ask a question or according to my own. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, they said um, we have to go back in two minutes. OK, yeah. great. Don't worry, it's just going to be very quick. Yeah, Karin talked about, um, you know, the work you did in India. Um, she talked about um, detection of um, wastewater pollution and all those. And I also asked the question in the in the main group. Beyond, okay, in the context of Africa, I would say, maybe Nigeria, uh, um, um, observation, yes, it's fine to observe. You already know the problems are there anyways. And so if I'm going to, Going to be talking about the context of Nigeria. We're talking about oil spill detection. We're talking about uh, uh, wastewater sewage. You know all that which will be easily captured. Now it's not just observing because we know the problems are there. It's not you get. So it is not what I'm looking at is um, like what Adele said. Are, are you also looking at detecting the problem versus what solution would work? You know what cost-effective solution is would work because detecting the problem is not enough here. This is what else. What 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 works for us? Yeah. So actually, so we are of course we are not like a super big company, so we are really focusing now on the monitoring, to be honest, and alerting, and work together with others like Xylem to really uh, or local municipalities and and to really go into the management of these. Um, because we don't have the, the knowledge, to be honest, to have all the solution in place. So we are rather, let's say, the observer and giving the information um, and turning this of, to a certain degree to some more additional information, but we cannot in the whole um, create like this um, management procedure. Here we have to work uh, together. Also in the Prime Water Project, we do this very closely together with drinking water um, providers, but they need, they have their knowledge and they share with us and then we can combine it. Actually, uh, uh, if we could get some uh, some feedback from you, uh, Philip, in terms of, uh, of your experience working with earth observation data or potential uh, ideas to where you think the technology could be applied. And then secondly, on how you see the COP and, and how you could potentially contribute uh, to, uh, to further, you would say, shed light on what we can do with, uh, with earth observation technology. But the first part was, was uh, really on this sharing of experience. Um, 
And again, um, I don't know if you can type and talk at the same time, but you could put it on the jam board or you can take the floor here. I would be happy to, to, to hear your background and how you are currently uh, working with Earth observation data or IDs for how you would like to, to apply the technology. Uh, Anyone want to start? Uh, can I start? Yes, sure. Feel free. <laughs> okay, about me, I'm in short JV because the name is very big. Okay. It's simply okay. JV. <laughs> uh, I'm basically a civil engineer, then an environmental engineer, now pursuing a PhD in uh, climate resilient uh, urban uh, water security. Uh, my contributions are I worked in ISRO for uh, 32 and a half years as a ground support. ISRO refers to Indian Space Research Organization. And also professionally, I am an alumni and a mentor at International Space University for one 10 years now. And a COSPAR associate member. And with regard to my involvement and contribution, I'm basically a trainer also, trainer, trainer. Uh, looking at the capacity building of urban local bodies and you know getting into the environmental management uh, using a space data set has become very common now in a way uh, especially i must thank the world water week last year where we had about 466 sessions and blue earth and such uh, projects are really eye openers so I want to just conclude at this uh, first introduction that today, unless we take further uh, the space data set to the civic bodies and uh, uh, community enabling, uh, you will be doing a little injustice. This is my firm belief. Uh, this has been my experience uh, being in the IDMP also, the WMO, where we had a lot of reviews uh, ongoing on the you know, various academic institutions in the Scandinavian countries working in South America, for example, and European University, European Union universities working in Africa, and many agencies in India also doing some work in Africa. So what I want to just say that uh, as a professional, I feel a training and capacity building of the community level I mean, down to earth, it can make a whale well of a difference because I'm not new to this water quality monitoring because GEMS under WHO is there already in 1980s. Since 80s, uh, they have gone so much advanced in the WHO on quantification of uh, the pollutants and also yeah. monitoring. So I want to stop at this. Uh, in simple terms, it is training and capacity building, which I feel a, a very important area. Thank you. Right. That's uh, really, uh, yeah, I know that I appreciate it. And, uh... Yeah, having myself worked on that quite a bit, capacity building, uh, I I tend to agree, but uh, I'm also aware about the challenge about uh, bringing the, the technologies, you can say, to non-earth uh, um, observation experts. It takes some uh, some thinking about how to do this in the right way, okay. and you're not overloading them with with um, yeah, with the latest technology, which can be quite difficult to to uh, to uptake, I think. And as you said, it's not a new technology; it's been around for a long, long time. But we tend to always focus on the latest and the newest, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, maybe yeah. forget sometimes that uh, <laughs> some somebody it's not everybody working in in in, in our field. But but uh, definitely uh, important point. Thank you. Anybody? Very much. Anybody else? Wanna, we are not that many, so I don't know, Mary. Uh, Tom, <laughs> I, <if> you wanna, <laughs> I was just going to say that I, I'd love to hear from, from Victor first, but then I'm happy to go. <laughs> um, so nice. No, just go. I'll be taking the notes. Please. All right. <laughs> I have the wrapper too. Right. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for taking the notes for us. So I, my background is, is in traditional water. The more the wet side, um, I was hired by the satellite um, division in NOAA, uh, NESDIS, to work on a bunch of projects, both in the United States as well as international. Um, I put those on the Jamboard. They are uh, CIOS Coast, 
Geo Aqua Watch, which is the water quality initiative. I also put the link in the chat to our meeting, which is going on next week, which all this, all this stuff and we're talking about today and all the participants are very relevant. So I think you'll find a home there too. Um, and uh, so I agree um, with you that the, especially in the capacity building sector, because I come from that background of being a, a water quality manager, um, I know what I need to know and satellite data helps me with that, but I don't need to get a PhD in satellite data to use it every day, right? For for what I what I need to know. So we are struggling in the Seas Coast, um, and NOAA Coast Watch and Geo Aqua Watch often to meet the managers where they um, need to be met with enough information. Um, also, the contribution of countries, I think, and the and the local um, stakeholders identified through capacity development really can be in that in situ data collection. You know, so I know I'm not going to go to a trade phone. That are so important for um, the, uh, the satellite data validation. So, because the um, satellite folks are in deep need for local data uh, and, it, and it, it helps. It's, it's a great way to build a partnership, I think. And I'll stop there. No, that's good. And, and again, yeah, just saying it's not about replacing each other, but actually working together. And I think that's a good way to bridge things and to, to get people fam familiar with the technology is actually to involve them in the yeah, calibration validation part of the, uh, of the, the exercise and maybe also building the credibility. Because I guess many of the people on the ground may maybe suspect uh, in terms of the accuracy that can be achieved. Right. Uh, I, I will just say say one other thing. There are many people on the science side of satellite oceanography who are trying to improve uh, the measurement of sea surface temperature and the resources that are thrown at that. Uh, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, let's focus over here on some of these other issues where um, I, I don't need to, to increase the precision of sea surface temperature by you know, a hundredth of a, of a degree, I need you to solve my water quality problem in, in inland and coastal areas that nobody wants to go to because right. they're so complex, so. Exactly, yeah. But thanks a lot for, for sharing these. And uh, Tom, you wanna have a go? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, lovely to virtually uh, uh, meet you guys. And, uh, you know, I appreciate uh, uh, the issues you have down in Florida, Mary, uh, with the, the red tides and uh, uh, and what goes on. Uh, I'm, I'm a process engineer, so I always think, uh, what am I going to do with this data? Um, and I make uh, and I work mainly in uh, water quality, drinking water originally, but uh, certainly looking at um, wastewater optimization uh, and CSO flows uh, at the minute. So my, my first thoughts uh, around this, and I've been watching this for several years now, uh, have been in uh, cities like Toledo, Ohio, where they have the big algal blooms. Um, I spent quite a lot of time working with New York City on which reservoir to choose at any particular time because they they pump a billion gallons a day, uh, 120 miles. Uh, so choosing a good source <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is 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 a good plan before you pump it into the city and throw chlorine at it. Um, <laughs> you know, so there's lots of uh, decision making um, that can be optimized based on this kind of, of data. Um, in the UK, we're starting to use um, EO data and hyperlocal uh, weather forecasting to protect dams and uh, other uh, structures. Um, locally, uh, my dam uh, broke recently. We had to evacuate the town, uh, and uh, uh, we've got a lot of aging infrastructure that's uh, that needs protecting. And getting that AI uh, ability uh, of predicting what the load's going to be on the sewers uh, and what kind of spills you're going to have out the back of your wastewater treatment plants. Um, down in, in Florida, we're doing some actual, uh, we have a, 
a real time microbial activity monitor, uh, which is uh, sort of a bio monitor. And at Lake Kane there, we're, we're tracking the algal blooms uh, in real time um, so that swimmers can get out and, and, and use um, that information. Uh, so uh, in, in the UK, we have some uh, an app called Rivers Fit to Swim. Um, so you can take some of that information uh, from uh, the e EO stuff. So you can say, OK, look, we've had some uh, heavy rains and we're going to see some quality problems flowing downstream. Uh, and you can update as that flows through the system and then say, look, it's good for swimming now. You're, you're, you're great. You're good to go. Um, yeah, so it, I, I think that engagement with the public is, is the key. Um, you know, as uh, as you said, Mary, you've got large sections of coast where there's a whole load of tourists, right? Uh, and keeping them informed uh, about what's going to happen, but also having that predictive ability to know that the sugar plantation is going <laughs> to flood through, and <laughs> you know, uh, um, would be would be really useful. I, I see so many exciting applications for this, um, and just uh, from the the geek side of me. Uh, just playing with it myself, you know. <laughs> you know, I love to see the maps and what's going on in uh, in different locations. Um, but uh, yeah, there's so many fabulous uh, ways that this can be applied, um, and um, with apps now, you can present data in such a consumable way, um, and being able to access that data and, and draw it down. Not just for um, you know high level process engineering sort of information, but uh, just public information as well uh, to engage people with their local rivers. Yeah, no, that's excellent point, and I think uh, exactly that point on the patterns because maybe it's not the most accurate or it doesn't compare in accuracy with in situ, but it has that spatial insight, you know, and uh, feeling both temporal gaps and then the, yeah the spatial patterns you could and impact areas you could. Often, uh... but that's it it's it's uh, um it it can show you where to focus your attention uh when, when we're doing the big ocean stuff the, the whole globe we need lots of uh data and we can't uh in situ monitor everything uh and and that changes over time so uh we can get use this big data to then generate where our hot spots are and where right. we should be focusing our attention right yeah Exactly. Yeah, good point. Um, but it's uh, I understood you are coming more from not exactly the EU, but but you see it being increasingly taking up, or is it more from just your curiosity that is taking it up, or do you actually see it being applied as well? Uh, yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's being applied. Um, yeah. You know the. Uh, the, the big data uh, AI models um, are being used to, to understand, uh, and particularly at the moment uh, in the UK, and we, we saw this coming uh, many years ago, but uh, of course we didn't uh, plan ahead in time, uh, but we have a lot of um, flash flood uh, problems right. now, and uh, our, our combined sewer system is not really fit to deal with that uh, but having data uh, around what's coming uh, and what's happening there means that you can almost use the sewer as an extension of your treatment uh, right. and storm tanks uh, and, and really start to do some quite interesting stuff once you have control of the whole network. Yeah, that's interesting. I was surprised to hear about uh, you said a dam break in the UK or something. We have been looking at a few in Asia and Brazil. I was uh, yeah, but but that's yeah, something yeah, yeah. we really want to see if you can also use EO to have the risk indicator for for which of the failing or the dams which is in yeah you could say unstable or at risk of the. Of, yeah, so it, yeah. It, it it was only a, a spillway that uh, uh, broke, but it started to dig away at the core of the dam. Um, so that dam has had to be drained. Very similar to what happened in Oroville uh, in um, California, if you remember that, it was the same year. Uh, right. And the, the Oroville spill well uh, just above Sacramento also um, collapsed. Uh, 
No, fortunately, not the whole dam. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, there was some panic, uh, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I thought I was just being informed that uh, we should also find time to uh, to to discuss the second agenda item, which was uh, oh. hearing if there's any suggestions on how we can move forward with the COP, how you could eventually contribute to this community of practice. Right. To, yeah. uh, I, I filled out on the Jamboard that I think um, separating the best practices uh, out from, there's a lot of information out there and maybe pulling the best of that and helping to make it a global best practice instead of a, uh, the EU way of doing things or the US way of doing things. Um, yeah, I think that would be really helpful. Oh, and it was nice point. to meet yeah. everybody. It was nice to meet you. I think <laughs> yeah. Lovely to meet everybody, yes. Yeah.